Thank you for your time, uh, opportunity to present uh, members of the board. Um, for about 35 years, I've designed historic museum exhibits. One of the worst things you do is just let the curator pick everything because everything's sacred. We're preservationists, and that's true of my presentation here. There's too many slides, I couldn't let go, and I will race through this. So uh, please hold any questions, and I'll, I'll try to keep it to the the half hour, but um, there's a lot to cover, so, so hold on here. This is Timber School, and this is a um, Photoshop I did probably 20 years ago. Uh, less skills than I have today, but the big thing I added to it was the red tile roof. And for years, it had a uh, asphalt roof. I drove by it going to Costco, or Blockbuster, never noticed the building. It's surrounded by 1960s buildings. They added on to it, just generic looking. It was, it was basically camouflaged. One of the things I wanted to point out is that it is both a Thousand Oaks landmark and a county landmark. And a lot of people in Thousand Oaks don't recognize that it's a um, county also. So 20 years ago, this was quite a, a issue in Thousand Oaks, uh, whether or not the school was going to stay. It was uh, originally public land, rezoned for commercial, and then rezoned again for mixed use. They realized that uh, the retail just wasn't happening anymore with, with so much online sales. Um, this made everybody nervous in the neighborhood and throughout the community when, you know, without notice, they started taking down the 68 or 60s um, addition buildings, classrooms all adjacent to it. Uh, thankfully, they didn't do anything to the building, you know, and, and I'm sure people within the planning community or, or planning staff knew that this was going to happen, but uh, I, I received so many calls of panic of, of what's going on. So this is what's left without the buildings, you know, over there to the left. I, I get lost in North South and in uh, the Canal. But to the left here is Coles, and uh, to the right is in and out Burger, if you know Thousand Oaks at all. Um, years ago, I was asked by a planning commissioner 15 minutes before the meeting start, did the school have any relevance? Um, because they were going to take it down and mitigate the soil for a million bucks and develop it. So I raced, looked at the building, and found this article in the library. And that's why I called them up. I said, please don't let them move any, any further with that. Um, it was one of the original Boise Wilson designs. It might be the original. I'd like to argue for that or try to find out. i got to do some homework. There's a mention of a Santa Paula district, but I don't know what building it is. And within a month, it's like, did the school open its doors? How do you buy for first, you know, in terms of uh, that sort of thing? Maybe it's the dates on the documents, uh, on the drawings. Uh, there wasn't much around at the time. Um, there were some pepper trees along the road out there, you know, there wasn't the 101, of course. It kind of lined the road so you had a bit of shade and demarked where the, the roadside was. But that big oval there is the school, and you can see it runs a little bit longer uh, vertically, which is um, Kirby Kelly Road. So out, out early on, satellite image, I'm really trying to find some more. I, got, I have so much homework to do, but I, I have a real, real job. Um, one of the things that's fun, that makes it a little bit easier to find, is the old drive-in right next door. So that's where Coles is now over in that area. Uh, this is looking the other way toward Westlake, so you can see the, the um, drive-in theater right there. And uh, just to the left of the oval, note, note some bushes there, and I'll show you what's hiding. Uh, a little bit closer, so again, uh, just to the left of those buses, which is what made the soil mitigation an issue lots of years of diesel and repairs and so forth on, on the land. Uh, the drive-in theater, you know, that, that a lot of the kids went to early on, and, and there's a big open space behind it that still hasn't been developed. We have a lot of the drawings from uh, Roy C. Wilson. Uh, I love hand drawings. They're, they're just art in themselves, but uh, we have a good dozen of those with his date and everything on there. And it, it no calls out a lot of the details that we'd like to preserve and, and keep. Uh, I had some discussions with the developer, which had been really beneficial. Sent her probably three quarters of a gig of photos and information. I've been collecting this for 20 years, so quite obnoxious. 
but uh, she was very excited. A lot of this might inform her design. So we'll, we'll see if it works out. One of the big ones is, of course, the threshold. It's iconic. And what's fun is you see just the little leaning of the O's in school and so forth. And it, it's very fun. Incised into the concrete, um, so it's not going anywhere. It's still there. And um, this is a before and after shot. And I caught this shot one day when I drove by and I realized something's different. And someone had taken down the lag bolted wood sign that said Caneo School. So I called up the city and said, where to go? Because the students might want that preserved who, who attended there for a lot of years. You'll notice that there, it's boarded up in the photo on the left. Uh, what they decided to do after there was several years of people living inside of it and vandalizing it and, and busting it up a bit is to take the windows and doors, put them inside, store them, and replace them down the road. There's never been a fence around the entire site. It's, it's been, it, there's a fence there, but not internally uh, once you got through. One of the things to note that's fun is that it actually did have a flagpole. People have never seen it up there. They've never seen a flag on it. So in the drawings, and I found photos of the flagpole. So it's a, it's a weird truncated piece when you look at it this way. You're like, you take it for granted, that's how it should be. I love the drawings. I'd love to bring that down and restore it. No one knows where the bell is. I'd love to crawl in it and see if the bell's still up there. But you can see the flagpole will tip up on top. This is the rear view of the school. So left to right were boys, girls, bathrooms. And that little tiny window there is the teacher's lounge, which usually was one or two teachers at most. So what I was talking about earlier, uh, behind the trees, is this um, water tower, water, water tank. And many people didn't know it was there. There's a little pavilion right next to it and so forth. What, what was that utilized for? Um, we're not sure, but the big thing that everybody wanted me to point out is this is the first pot water and power building, public building in the Kanea. We were really upgraded. We felt like we were a big deal and modernized uh, with that innovation. Rear view and back view, so you're looking toward the Santa Monica Mountains, which was the playground back there with this amazing tree. And if you flip that around, you see the, the school back there. And if I could ever find an expert on cars, I don't know if that's a Model A. Uh, Model T's came out in 24, so it gives you a sense of uh, time. But 64, what's that, uh, 20, 40 years later, you, know, you get a sense there. So this is the, the original layout. Um, on either side of blue, you see the classrooms. Uh, foyer in the, in the a hall, it's all concrete there. The, the two classrooms are wood floors. I believe they are maple, my, my namesake. Uh, the corridor up above is, is concrete. And then there's the two bathrooms up above. And to the far left is a little kitchenette. Um, I have a good dozen or two dozen drawings of renovations, upgrades, repairs, seismic, and everything over the years. We had our children in there. They weren't going to let it rot and fall apart. They made it up to code for protecting our most valuable assets. Um, so that's this is the used car you want to buy. It's been managed by somebody who cares about the, the site and the school. So uh, one of the difficult things in a museum to do is to interpret time. And so this really helps do that because you see the overalls, these are the clothes. Girls wore skirts back then, you know, everything that um, is so different from today. And we keep judging this building by modern standards. It's so small, it's, it's boring, there's not a lot to it. But it's, that's not the story. Who designed it? Who went there and so forth? So uh, I love the teacher's view. They're exhausted. They probably had to do everything. They even were paid extra for like sweeping the floors and up, upkeeping. Um, but it, it's fun. I have a lot of photos. There's probably a lot more of these children as they grow year by year. So you can catch some of them. But I, I'm focused on the teacher. My wife's a teacher. So I, I think of how tiring this must be. But also, I love the overalls. Uh, mm -hmm. 37, I think. I, I'm not real clear on that date. This is 38. Um, love the sepia look of it and so forth. 47, just after World War II, you're starting to get the fawns up there on the right, and uh, you know what that community started looking like. Now I think 48, 49, it's grown so big to school, the, the population, that you broke it into classes. So this is third, fourth, fifth. It's no longer the, the entire school there on the, 
the threshold. And we have receipts, the kids who went there. So the back of a lot of these photos I'm showing you, these are the names written in the back. You know, here's, here's 33, who went there? So you're looking at Frederick, Porcher, uh, the Jantz family. You know, so many founding pioneer families of the Caneo attended this school. Uh, I don't know the Timberettes. I, I don't know the name for these ladies, but it'd be very fun to find out. We're moving into the 50s. It's still Timber School. We were Timberland. There wasn't a Thousand Oaks. That happened 40 years after the school was built. Uh, moving into the 80s, I don't know why, we skipped the 70s. It was an embarrassing time for fashion or something. But um, this is when it became uh, Caneo Valley High, which was a continuation school. And a lot of these kids before independent study and so forth, these were the at-risk kids that didn't fit into the community. So they are extremely passionate about preserving the school and what it did for them. The teachers who attended, they are more connected than you'll see in many high school students. So the upgrade and change as it became the continuation school was the library over here on the left. Offices were on the right with the principal and, and uh, secretary and so forth. The reception desk with the receptionist. And uh, still everything in the back there. I've never seen the bathrooms. Be fascinated by that. Um, so this is a view inside. Uh, let's see if I can get my blazer going. Yeah, there it is. So up here, where it says Bell Pool, that little hole is that hole in the attic. And I won't say who climbed into the attic. Um, and this, there. That ladder takes you up to the cupia, cupola up upstairs and into the bell and everything else. But the, the rope went up that ceiling into that pulley and over to the bell to be pulled by you know, the, the, the student of the week or something, you know, so it was a very VIP role to have. Um, I, my first degree was uh, construction technology. I'm used to working in historic buildings and seeing them in this sad shape, and it's cosmetic. There's so much you can do, you know, especially if you have a fully reinforced concrete building, to restore this. Sand down the floors, take off the temporary walls. It scares people who are not builders when they see this, and it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, this is looking out that threshold, iconic entrance there, you know, looking out, staff again to the left, library is to the right. Um, this is inside the library, I'm pointing to where I first saw that sign 21 years, 22 years ago that said this, this is, you know, basically out of history. It is connected to an older wood building, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And this is the interior that got me very frustrated and, and saying we need to do something to keep people out of this, this, this building. So there's what I'm bragging on is the maple floor down below, staff offices, the concrete corridor in the back and the bathroom or the kitchen over there to the upper left. And uh, oh. oh, this is backwards. You'll see out the window there is the giant sound wall. And one of the reasons they didn't go retail is there was no visibility from the freeway in terms of seeing this as wall or outlets or anything like that. It was, it's blind. And uh, Caltrans said, yeah, no, we're not going to come and remove that wall. It took us a long time to get around to. So the 48 Auditorium is also a landmark. And it was used for all kinds of civic activities because it was one of the gathering places around that did have water and power. So voting, uh, you know, you, you name it was going on at the time. But you could also see my flagpole up there that I'm, I'm hoping to have uh, reinstalled. So lots of little details are still there. The lights aren't out front and so forth. Uh, the windows were there. I'm hoping they were well preserved. You, you talked about that today in terms of retrofitting and we're putting them back in. Um, there are some odd notes written on the wall. Somebody who's technical did drawings with measurements. And it may have been the person who removed the windows. I'm not sure what those are. Inside the auditorium, you have the stage, you have the storage of chairs underneath the stage and so forth. Uh, Larry Jantz told me this was his first performing uh, performance uh, as a strawberry on stage. So he's very proud of that. There's a kitchen over to the left there. The plan by the developer is that the school itself will be like administration offices, 
and this would possibly be daycare for the, the residents and so forth, but they're still working it out because there's very limited parking for having this used for anything else that's going to be a community center. Here's, here's a view inside the kitchen, uh, on the stage, and today. Now this is a little bit of a cleaned up shot uh, I took a couple months ago when they cut down the foliage and everything. It's been left pretty much abandoned. You know, there, there hasn't been any real maintenance. Uh, I'll drive by, call up, it's on my way to in and out you know, stop by and see the gate's gone, this is busted. Call up and nag the community, it's being tagged and so forth. And so they, they're pretty good at getting out there quickly to do it, but um, I wish it was a bit more proactive. I, I, it wasn't dependent on public notifying them. So the, every time it rains, we get some good foliage. It grows to four or six feet tall all around the, the entrance there, all around the base of the building. Anybody who knows construction says don't grow things that close to the building. Or uh, when it dries up during historic droughts, we worry about fires and so forth, you know, what, what can happen in that direction. I don't know why they're carving up the asphalt and throwing dirt against the building. It's, it's an odd thing that they're doing right now. Um, they were asked when it became a landmark by the city to, in good faith, preserve the 1916 pepper trees that were there out here along Kelly Road. Uh, about two, three weeks ago, they cut down almost every tree except, I think, a walnut tree on the site. So that's, that's what you're seeing there. So one of the things that we get joked about by various communities around us is that we are becoming thousand stumps. And so when you see all the stumps back here all around, it makes people nervous. They're like, what happened? Now, we had a historic drought that killed some of these trees. They were abandoned. Nobody was watering. Water was all cut off and everything. So these, these trees are dead, some of them. Now, do we have artifacts? Now, what I talked to with the uh, architect is, is putting some of these in the foyer, the entrance with some of the photos of the classes. Uh, this is a painting that's now in the district office. It was in the library before, but it moved to the, the the uh, Thousand Oaks District offices. So it would be great if this were put back into the, the uh, building. Uh, a neighbor of mine collected these, found them at a garage sale, brought me these district things. They're so fun because you get to see who the teachers were, what they were emphasizing, what they were teaching, and of course the lag bolt sign up above. I think would be important to that. Well, our discussion about the bell, um, for some reason they have 1888 and they claim the school was 1889. So it must have been a year made before the school began or, or was there. But this is over at Cypress Elementary School. So it wouldn't be the 1924 bell, but it'd be fun to move that back you know, to the site just to tag history a little bit. Um, totally up to you all and the architect where you want to put plaques if you want to put them. Um, this is from the Jantz house. Uh, he sent me a photo of what they had there, and so I tagged it on their Photoshop just to give a sense of what it might look like. Now it has ridiculous, I took them off, but energy star and, and no drug signs and so forth. It's like, scratch those out. Uh, worked with the Canal Valley Historical Society and to come up with the right wording for these, and we're getting pretty close, but of course it's a joint venture with everyone, and I, th I think we're doing real well at that. So shape of the county and a lesser plaque on, on the land, uh, landlord. But also I let people know this, this Building next door is um, after you know 48, but it's also a landmark. So what are the plans now? Well, I don't know really. I've only seen one rendering of what they've got up going up now. It's, this is, I believe, the second developer, if not third, but I'm pretty sure the second. Um, the first developer had these images of what it would look like and what they were planning. So in the upper left there is the school. So you can see how much amazing amount of property is, is around it. Uh, from what I'm hearing from the new developer, they are not going to do the density bonus. They're going to keep it a bit less, but the people who used to have a view behind them are really not happy about the three-story and more buildings. But I, I've said that's, that's out of my camp. I, I Please preserve the two buildings there. What goes on behind it and adjacent to it, I don't want to let others battle it out and, and so forth. This is the most recent illustration, and I don't see a rendering. And I see nothing about the school in it. Maybe that's cropped and it's way down the road and so forth, but um, I've been able to talk to them. So I'm switching uh, stories here. Let's see how much time I'm doing. All right. 
to Cadeo Valley overall, uh, some of the history there. And one of the things, I grew, I grew up in Orange County when it had orange groves. I moved here 30 something years ago because it was just gorgeous open space and not developed. And so there were, uh, there are quite a few things. We're, we're not as you know, old as uh, Ventura County, so we're, we're a bit young. But in, from 76 to 88, you were the Cultural Heritage Board. You, you provided services. And there was 10 nominations and designations within that time frame. Then there was a decade, basically, in between where nothing happened. And they took it on, Thousand Oaks said, we'll be our own cultural heritage board, and nothing happened. I'll, I'll let that speak for itself. And then three buildings were nominated and became landmarks from 97 to 2004. And then for two decades after that, nothing has been designated. And um, that here we are today, you know. So Timber is coming up for its 100th anniversary centennial next year. So is there a cultural heritage board? Is there something from the community? Thousand Oaks is 60 years old. Timber's 40 years older than that. Will anybody make sure that this is preserved? So the areas in red here are landmarks that have disappeared, that are no longer there. So one of the stagecoach in, it was, it's a, it burnt down. So it's not the original building and not on the original site. Dos Vientos barns are gone and global, the jungle land is basically a plaque now. It's, it was bought by Internet Dominion to create the new civic center. So they're doing a, a draft plan that's going before the city council tonight, and we used to have a dozen pages of what our cultural heritage board would do, the Thousand Oaks. They really care. This is what they, they plan for the community. We have a few paragraphs now of what they're gonna do. And so I'm hoping they'll elicit, or create a survey and look at what's at risk and what needs to be preserved so that we don't play whack-a-mole and every time something comes up of historic value, there's an outrage. You know, it would really knock down some of the worries and concerns. Thousand Oak Civic Center, ah, this is where the fonts go bad. <laughs> so this, this was something that I watched for years. It was abandoned. I, I consider it in demolition by neglect. They were going to build, you know, new buildings up there. But this was our first built city hall. 54 architects competed, so many that we had to fill up the high school stadium or um, auditorium with all the competition boards of, of who was going to win. And this strange man down in San Diego basically did like Navy and boats, won it because he didn't build the Greek civic building. He went with what they were requesting, and a great designer does that. So 70% of it was going to be open space. So you had to come up with where we put the parking spaces. You looked at the community you were serving, and it represented what their plan was for the community. 70% open space, you know, a lot of that. So it's it's in, you know, architectural magazines and so forth, and I have our original copy of that. Not hard to do. And I went out this weekend and took some pictures of it with the plaques that they eventually put in. Um, the left building, or, or looking down the stairs of the entry, is, um, leased by the Park Service right now, but that may run out and it may go elsewhere. To the right is a lot of civic community things, uh, theater and so forth. So it gives you a sense of how, what wasn't around. We have Fireworks Hill, which is a big focus on the 4th of July, just above it. Janet's Mall, Moore Park 101 down the road there. Here's a close up of it. So one of the big innovations was parking on the roof. And you'll see uh, like the GT or the building down the road was basically, this was a um, inspiration for that. And inspiration for a building I did at Mount St. Helens that it fit into the building or landscape so it didn't uh, obscure view and so forth. It was picked on as the eyebrows on the hill, uh, the bunker and so forth. We have a hundred homes and this is part of the survey. Uh, you know, is this a point of interest? I, I would be thrilled at people that so many people in the, in the Eichler community don't know that we have these here. And they're just gorgeous. And they happen to be put into place in 64 when Thousand Oaks became a city. I didn't realize that until the day I put two and two together. They're gorgeous. I would love to have one as a studio, but yeah, they're, they're 900,000 and so forth. The fire station, again, designed by Roy C. Wilson. It's on the Ventura Museum uh, drive through map of, of visiting his sites. So it's one of them. It's um, 
looks a little bit earlier than when you designed it, you know, or, or later, and it's just a, a modern design for the time. But it gives you an idea, there was nothing around here at the time. It's really fun. This is it now. It's, it's abandoned, but they do seem to be uh, behind those concrete red staccato things is where they do have people in that office still. Because I wanted to try to get it out and look around. Those Vientos Barns, uh, county landmark again. I don't know how much communication happens between Thousand Oaks and the county. You know, how much do they ask you about what we're going to do when we develop all this community? And what do you want to happen in this bar? And is there communication? I know there's a, we don't want to step on toes situation a lot of times between entities. Um, curious thing, and I'm, I'm researching this, is five years after the wood was bought, bought from the original timber school, they built these barns. So I'm wondering if some of the wood ended up at the barn. So that'd be fun. Um, huge barns, lots of wood. But this is what happened to it. The city council hired a firm for thousands of dollars that was um, professional uh, preservationists. They would, they would number the wood, document how it was taken apart, stored um, securely <laughs> so that it, nothing would happen to it. And this is the pile when I went for a, for a hike one day, I saw this pile. I, I couldn't put two and two together. There was this really the dose of this barn. Somehow, the state of Chen got permission to take that wood, some of it, and build a Smith's shop. Now, did they talk to the county for permission? You know, what, what happened there? You know, what, what was the way to happen? They're talking to Larry Jantz. He's a bit concerned about his family home. You can see the lock on the door is a chain in the back. Uh, it's getting weathered and so forth. It is a landmark, but it doesn't have a purpose right now. And you know that when buildings aren't used and abandoned, and that's when they become vulnerable. So if there's... Uh, Reinterest in this, or maybe notifying that it, it's at risk, you know, would be a great thing in some sort of survey. Um, so the survey again, if, if something was done, I don't know if it's a county, it's private hired by the city, but instead of the, the frustration everyone has right now, the general plan is kind of asking for the developer to notice and feel like if there's any hit, thing of historic value, then they hire their own uh, professional to evaluate whether or not it does, and then it might become a landmark or protected. Not, not the best route, you know, it's, it's too internal. You really need a third party to look at this stuff. As an example, these are two, uh, that circle there is a POW tree or a MIA during Vietnam. We had two young men who were missing during that time. They planted these oaks leading down to the Thousand Oaks City Hall that we would remember them missing. The one on the left when the building was abandoned, uh, not water, the bushes, and so forth, that tree died. That, PO, that MIA fellow, young man, died. The one on the left, he survived. And so they, they built a sculpture of the Civic Center that shows uses the wood of the one on the left. Um, Carson's been there for, since 46, you know, the Eichler homes. Uh, there's so many things that might be of value, either point of interest or landmark or something, but no one is designating these or evaluating it. We've not had a survey that I've never heard of. So I uh, want to bring that to your attention, and thank you for your time. And if we have time for questions, I'm, I'm open.